Okay, we'd like to welcome you back to our current event and weekly Bible study for 9-21-08, and we're going to uh, go into part two here, probably our last part today, and we'll finish up the pharmacia study uh, next week. From this article we read, it is interesting to note that in the Middle Ages, witchcraft was heavily associated and influenced by women. In the Middle Ages, Europe and the sick often consulted with witches who would brew up special potions of various herbs and drugs for their maladies. A great resource and reference book by Barbara Walker, 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 I'm sorry, titled The Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets, covers this past history in great detail. In the section on witchcraft, Walker says, Up until the 15th century, women's charms and spells were virtually the only repository of practical medicine. Churchmen avoided doctrine on the ground that all sickness came from demonic possession. They, they just... Evidently, a lot of them viewed that any type of sickness was just demonic possession. And the only permissible cure was exorcism. In pre-Christian Gaul, in Scandinavia, medicine was entirely in the hands of women. Even in the Christian era, the village wise woman was still every peasant's family doctor. Per Periclesius said witches taught him everything he knew about healing. Dr. Lamb of the Duke Buckingham's famous devil was said to have learned the secrets of medicine by consorting with witches. It wasn't unusual for witches' healing charms to be preferred to those of the church, or for those, or for the two to be regarded as identical in essence. And in other words, anything that the church could present as far as healing goes, you know, they were kind of on a level playing field. What the distinction between sorcery and witchcraft boiled down to was that men couldn't practice ma could practice magic, women couldn't. So in other words, it's just semantics here, is all we're really dealing with with that last statement. For some reason, most people today have no idea about the past history, more, nor do most believe that things like sorcery and witchcraft go on anymore, other than in a harmless way. The magic arts have been the way the human race was for a long time. If you study ancient history, the ruling elite were many times deeply involved in these evil practices as they are today. However, it has always been a very secretive movement. The reason I point this out is, is that to say just the same kinds of things are going on today as they were back then. Nothing has changed. Just because many of those who practice witchcraft and sorcery put on the fancy suits, have college degrees backing them up and media publicity behind them, doesn't mean that, that things are any different. It's just more palatable, in other words. The ruling elite that directs and influences the pharmaceutical and the medical industry is sworn to secrecy to keep their magic arts from the public. Otherwise, their game would be over. And we're going to get into that in much greater depth when we get into the next part of the study. In the New Testament, Jesus made it quite clear that a generation of wicked people were linked to the snake. Every time he addressed these people, it was with swift and precise condemnation for their actions. The most powerful passage occurs in the Gospel of Matthew. Ye serpents, ye generations of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Matthew 23, 33. As I dug deeper into the Bible to research this subject, I found it rather intriguing that the symbol of the snake has been linked with the pharmaceutical in the medical industry. Is this just another clue that God has left for us to identify the adversary? It is very interesting that of all the symbols they could have adopted, the snake happens to be the one that they have adopted. And we're going to prove that. There are actually two different medical symbols that use the serpent. One is called the caduceus which is a staff surmounted by two wings and entwined with two snakes. This symbol is used by both the medical profession and the pharmaceutical industry. The other symbol is called the Star of Life. It consists of a serpent wrapped around a rod and encompasses and it is encompassed by a six-point... I really wouldn't call it a star. It's like a six-pointed... Like it would be like three lines that intersect and in that form a six-pointed figure, and is identified with the emergency medical services, like on the outside of an ambulance or something like that. Both of these symbols date back thousands of years, with deep roots in the occult and ancient pagan paganism, further linking sorcery, witchcraft, and magic to the to the medical practice. I find it rather amazing that it was the serpent that tricked Eve in the Garden of Eden. And it's the serpent that this industry has, has been chosen to be linked with. 
interesting parallel. When the serpent deceived Eve, he did it by getting her to eat a food that God didn't authorize. Another interesting parallel. I would like to elaborate a little bit more on these two medical symbols so that you will have a clear picture on their pagan connection. Now, I'm looking at the symbol of the caduceus right now, and you would instantly recognize this, particularly if you live in America. And again, it's a rod with two serpents wrapped around the rod, and then they ultimately end up facing off against one another at the very, very top. There's wings above them, and that's the caduceus. Now, this is from, um, uh, a de this is a definition of the caduceus, I believe from Wikipedia. The caduceus, or the wand of Hermes, it's another name for it, the wand of Hermes, is typically depicted as a short herald staff entwined by two serpents in the form of a double helix and sometimes surmounted by wings. In later antiquity, the caduceus may have provided the basis for the astrological symbol representing the planet Mercury. And in the Roman iconography, was often depicted being carried in the left hand of the Greek god Hermes, who is a, just a fallen angel. Okay, the messenger of the gods. Hermes was the messenger of the gods, the guide of the dead, the protector of merchants, gamblers, liars, and thieves. I mean, you know, that's always a good connotation. He protected liars, gamblers, and thieves. He's the god of deception, theft, and trickery. Okay, so this is this is the this is the caduceus, what it represents. Now, remember Westcott and Hort, the guys that, that came out with the revised version of 1881. They started the Club of Hermes. Okay, which is those are the guys that translate. Uh, the revised version that has essentially spawned every modern day Bible version that we have. Just a little side note there. I got into that in much greater depth on my study on the King James. Then we go further. The caduceus is many times used as a symbol for medicine, especially in North America. Though confusion, through confusion with traditional medical symbols, the rod of, of Asclepius, which has only a single snake and no wings, given um, in other words, sometimes they're confused, these two symbols. Given the historical attested use of this emblem, its adoption as a symbol of the medical medicine is a great irony. So, in, in other words, when it says, given the historical attested use of this emblem, its, adopted, its adoption as a symbol of, of the medical profession and the pharmaceutical profession is of great irony. Now, this is what a secular source is saying. It's of great irony. Why? Because the caduceus is essentially a demonic thing that we're talking about here. It's, it's, it's de dealing with, you know, the Greek god Hermes, you know, the god of, the, the protector of gamblers, liars, thieves, the god of deception, theft, and trickery. Theft and trickery. And this is the very symbol that you have associated with the medical profession. You know, it's kind of ironic is what they're saying, that it is. Now, this symbol is used by both the medical profession and the pharmaceutical industry. The other symbol, which is the Star of Life, it consists of a serpent wrapped around a rod and encompassed in a six-pointed star and is identified with the emergency medical services. So, um, this other symbol is called the Star of Life. It consists of a serpent wrapped around a rod or encompassed in a six-pointed star. Actually, and again, it's more like three lines that intersect, okay? And it's identified with emergency medical services, particularly in America. Now, the six-point star is the hexagram. Okay, hex, six, you know, mean the, the, the number of man. Uh, hex meaning curse, hexagram. It's the highest symbol in witchcraft. Now, this is a definition of the star of life. is a blue six-pointed star outlined with a white border, which features the rod of Asclepius in the center, originally designed and governed by the U.S., National Highway Traffic Safety Administration under the United States Department of Transportation. And don't think these governmental agencies don't know exactly what they're doing, because they do. Traditionally, in the United States, the logo was used as a stamp of authentication or certification for ambulances, paramedics, or other EMS personnel. Internationally, it represents emergency medical services, units, and personnel. A similar orange star is used for search and rescue personnel, and yet another version is used for wilderness emergency medical technicians. Now, I'm sorry, but if you have this thing on the outside of your truck or on the outside of your thing, you're, it's, it's essentially like saying, yes, demons come in, okay? Yes, there are going to be demonic or fallen angelic entities that are associated 
with these particular symbols. And if you're operating under the banner of that symbol, don't think it's not going to ultimately affect you. It has to affect you in some way, shape, or form, and it has to be negative. I was just saying before, I worked in a, uh, a clinic a long time ago, and when we moved into this one clinic, it had been a pure medical clinic beforehand, and they had this, this rod of, of uh, Asclepius on the outside. It wasn't really considered a caduceus because it was only one single snake, but it was this big wood thing, and it was actually attached to the door. It was huge, and I actually went out there one day on the weekend, and I, I stinking got under it with a pry bar and busted the thing off and got rid of it and restained the door so you couldn't even tell it looked normal, okay? But I didn't want that thing on the outside of the uh, of the door anymore because I knew it was it was bringing in demonic stuff. Now the actual uh, definition of this rod of Asclepius, which is which is essentially what we just talked about as the star of life that's used on the EMS and the ambulances. The rod of Asclepius is an ancient Greek symbol associated with astrology and with the healing of the sick through medicine. Healing of the sick through medicine through pharmakia. It consists of a serpent entwined around a staff. So it's very appropriate, if you think about it, I mean, as far as what it's associated with. It's very appropriate, from a witchcraft standpoint, that they would use these symbols. Okay? See, a lot of times occultists, or the people that own these large multinational pharmaceutical companies, they want, in some ways, they're very, very flagrant about what they do. And to me, this is very, very flagrant. They're just relying on you being totally ignorant of these things so that you'll never know there's any bad connotation to it at all. And this is why the Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians 2.11, let Satan get an advantage of us where we are not ignorant of his devices. And if we go further, it says it consists, this rod of Asclepius, consists of a serpent entwined around a staff, not a double serpent, just one. Uh, Asclepius was the son of Apollo and was a practitioner of medicine in the ancient Greek mythology. The rod of Asclepius symbolizes the healing arts by combining the serpent, which in shedding its skin is a symbol of rebirth and or fertility, with the staff, which is the symbol of authority. It's also the symbol of sexuality, you know, the male phallus. The symbol of authority befitting the god of medicine. So that's what that one's about. Remember, a tree is known by its fruit. Now, among the Greeks, the caduceus was carried by heralds and ambassadors as a badge of office and the mark of a personal inv inviolability. Because it was the symbol of Hermes, the messenger of the gods, in other words, by, in other words another book by Barbara Walker, the um, Woman's Dictionary of Symbols and Sacred Objects, she discusses the caduceus, where she says, quote, The classical Greek writers claim that Hermes inherited the caduceus in his character of the conductor of souls. It was said that his magic staff had enough healing power to even raise the dead from Hades and bring them back to the light of day. Now, this is what an occultist is saying about this symbol that is the main symbol of medicine in America. Okay? That Hermes, not only is Eclepius associated with pharmakia and medicine, but Hermes, his his it had enough black magic healing power to raise the dead from Hades and bring them back to the light of day. Now that's a lie from the pit of hell. Once you're in hell, you're in hell. No demon's going to get you out, that's for sure, or no fallen angel. But this was the myth. Going further, it says, There are some who say these medical symbols actually come from the Bible and that they are good. Although the snake wrapped around a rod is the symbol of the star of life and it has some connection to the Bible, is quite a stretch to justify its use today to mean what it did back then. I think this is important because we need to look at both sides of this issue because some people will invariably argue this next point that we're going to expose. When the nation of Israel was wandering through the desert, the people became angry for lack of food and water and spoke out against God and Moses. They said to Moses, Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul lo loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of 
and much people of Israel died. Therefore the Lord came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass, that as every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass, that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Numbers 21, 5 and 9. Now, again, this was, this was a matter of faith. If you, I mean, this was a matter, I don't know why exactly God did this in this exact, in this exact way, but it was a matter of, do you have faith to believe what God told you, is what it really ended up boiling down to. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Okay, so that is why I believe that what he did is, they questioned God, which was essentially saying we have little faith, Okay, and I'm not saying anybody's ever questioned God has little faith, but I'm saying in this particular instance, God used the subject of faith, and it was faith in basically what he said, in order to test them. Okay, and, and so that was why I believe he, he did it this way. The Bible indicates that this symbol was only meant for this particular instance, since after the Israelites finally reached the promised land, it became a form of idolatry and sin. Under the reforms of King Hezekiah, it was later destroyed. I don't know if you knew that, but it was later destroyed. Here is how the Bible records that event. This was in 2 Kings 18.4. He, Hezekiah, removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves. The groves, remember we talked about the groves last week? And break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. End of quote. Now, again, this is why I am so big on not forming symbols. Because every time we form symbols, whether we want to have our long-haired, hippie version Jesus pictures, and that's not the way Jesus looks, that's the way the Catholic Church says he looks, okay? It's a contradiction in the Word of God, because the Bible says, Doesn't nature therefore itself teacheth, the, teacheth us that it is a shame for a man to have long hair? Why would Jesus go, be walking around with long hair then? No, that's the Catholic version of what they think that Jesus is supposed to look like. And when the Antichrist shows up with his minions and his ascended masters, guess what? There's going to be one that looks just like that long-haired Jesus. And everybody's going to think it's the real Jesus. I've done a whole study on that. In previous studies, uh, I would look under... Uh, it was the one I did on the Nephilim. If you want to know about the Nephilim, just key in the keywords N-E-P-H. N-E-P-H in the search box on my homepage, and I've done several teachings on the Nephilim and the Ascended Masters and those types of guys. So anyway, um, they ended, King Hezekiah ended up having to break down the brazen serpent and, and break it, and because... God does not want us worshipping symbols. We're not to bow ourselves down to graven art or these types of things. And God knows that if man is given the opportunity to do that, he will do it. For some reason, man has this unbelievable desire to have some symbol he can go to and worship. Now, a lot of times people worship the cross. I've done a whole teaching on that. It's called the cross versus the accursed tree. I would recommend you, you, you check it into that. The Catholic Church had... had uh, just about everything to do with giving us that symbol as well. Okay? And there's a lot of different kinds of crosses, too. So, you know, these are just things that we don't want to be bowing down and worshiping. The Bible is very clear that the Godhead is not like that of gold or silver or of a graven art or of man's de device. And we talked about that last week. The Godhead is not like that. We're not to bow ourselves down to idols. Okay? But this is the temptation evidently I, I personally I don't have a temptation to do that I don't know why it's just something I just don't have any temptation but for most people evidently it really must be an issue okay, it doesn't mean I think I'm better or I'm perfect or anything like that I just don't quite understand it personally I guess it's because you can see it and feel it maybe I, I don't know I, I, I just don't get it just about every other place in the Bible where the serpent appears it is linked with Satan this fact alone should be enough convincing evidence of who to know who is behind medicine and the pharmaceuticals. The most identifying passage of Satan and the serpent appears in the book of Revelation. Revelation 12, 9. And he, the great dragon, was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. How do they deceive him? 
Well, we just talked about that. One of the main ways is through their sorceries. Pharmakia is the root word for that particular word in the Bible. What's some other ways? Lying, signs, and wonders, and miracles, which were wrought by Satan, by the, by the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Okay, and, the, and these other false Christs as well. Okay, so now we've got, and I've talked about this extensively in previous teachings, we've got the primary and chief way that we can identify that the, that the deception that is coming, that God said he was going to send in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where it says God will send them strong delusion, that they will believe a lie, that they might all be damned to receive not the love of what? The truth? What is the truth? Thy word is truth. The Bible's very clear on that. Thy word is truth. Just make sure you have the right Bible, the King James Bible. The Bible is very clear on, on that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free if you continue in my word. Jesus said that. Okay, so this is how we find out truth. But we know that the primary way is this deception is coming, that God is permitting to come, that God says he will send, is going to be through miracles, lying signs and wonders, through sorcery, pharmakia. What is that all intricately related to? Witchcraft. Every single bit of it. So when I say the essence of the coming one world religion, the coming one world deception, the coming deception and delusion under Antichrist and the false prophet is going to be witchcraft. That is why I talk about this so much because there's very few other people that get into these subjects. Now I'm not saying if you're a pastor out there listening to this and I'm condemning you, I'm just saying it's my calling to do this as a watchman because there's so few that, that, that get into this. Okay? There's a lot of other things I don't get into that a lot of other preachers do get into. And that's, you know, hey, we're part of the body of Christ. Everybody has a different function. Okay? And the Bible talks about that. It says every man is giver, given a measure of faith. It, it, the Bible is very clear that in Romans. Every man is given a measure of faith. And that faith, a lot of times, applies to the different callings. And it's very clear in that particular portion of Scripture that it a lot of times applies to your given calling. Okay, as part of the body of Christ. Can the finger say to the eye, I depart of me, I have no need of you? No, it can't, okay? The body of Christ, everybody's important. Okay, and not everybody's called to do the same thing. I mean, not everybody's called to be a finger. If we were all doing a finger's job, we wouldn't get anything done. You have to have the body in order to get the, the job accomplished. So I just wanted to make that proviso. So I don't think, so I don't act like I'm trying to elevate myself or make myself look better. I'm saying it's, everybody's important in the body of Christ, okay? So if we go further, so you, so I ask you again, why has the medical community decided to adopt, to adopt a symbol that is blatantly identified with Satan, Satanism and ancient paganism? The fact that the word pharmaceutical means sorcery, magic, or witchcraft only proves that the industry is under the influence of dark forces. It appears that the pharmaceutical industry is paving the way for Satan's final takeover of the control of this earth. It is one aspect. I'm not going to say it's the only aspect. But it is absolutely, totally one aspect, and, and hopefully by the end of the study you, you will see that. The serpent's goal seems to be to get every person on the planet consuming some type of pharmaceutical drug, preferably the mind-altering ones, but a lot of times it's not even the mind-altering ones. Uh, we were just talking about this the other day. There's this, uh, there's this very powerful acne drug called Accutane. This was on like the 6 o'clock news the other night. And they were saying that this, that this kid took it. And he had acne. This kid was like an honor roll student. He was, he was in, you know, he was just, he had a good life. And all of a sudden, he gets on this Accutane. Like a week later, he's killed himself. I don't know. I think he, I think he shot himself in the head or something. And they had absolutely no idea. His parents had no idea. He hadn't even exhibited any depression symptoms. Kills himself right after he gets on the Accutane. So there's su and one of the side effects of Accutane is that suicide, depression. But it wasn't emphasized by the doctor before he took it. Okay, so even the mind, the non-mind altering drugs. This is an act. It's very toxic to the liver. It's very risky. I actually took that drug when I was a teenager. I remember, it was one of the few drugs I've ever taken. And I don't think it had any real side effects in my case. But, you know, it's a really, really toxic drug. And this was before I learned a lot of the stuff that I know now, obviously. Okay, because I was no different than anybody else growing up. Okay, I don't want to say I've lived this pristine, puritanical life all my life and I've never put anything on my body to defile it in any way, shape, or form. Because that's a lie, too. Okay, I grew up in a very new age, unsaved, secular liberal background and was exposed to a lot of wickedness. 
So I, the Bible talks about consider the pit from whence you were dug. And I definitely can consider the pit from whence I was dug. And it was a deep one. So if we go further, uh, the serpent's goal seems to be getting to be getting every person on the planet consuming type, some type of pharmaceutical drug every day. So far, the pharmaceutical industry has done a terrific job at fulfilling his will. Children are being put on Ritalin in an unprecedented fashion. Millions of women are taking birth control pills. Uh, and again, I've done a whole teaching on, on the subject of contraception. That if, is contraception biblical? Is, can, we, can we go into the Bible and justify contraception? Okay, let's take a biblical look. Who cares about what our opinion is? Because our opinions don't mean anything if they don't line up with the Word of God. Well, I've done a whole teaching on contraception. You can reference that. And the one thing I will say is that you don't even have to type the full word in on the, on the search box. Even if you type in C-O-N-T-R, just a part of the word, you can find the teaching, which I think is a really cool feature that Sermon Audio puts out. They do a dynamite job of trying, I think, to make these teachings accessible. Uh, then it goes on to say, many men are taking sexual performance drugs like Viagra. Middle-aged and elderly women are taking menopause medications. You know, this Viagra thing, a lot of these, I, 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 this was a study. This was something that they were having a real problem with, and they still are. This whole thing with Viagra, it's causing something in these elderly people to happen that normally would not happen. And what's happening is, is some of them are having a lot of these illicit sexual relationships, even in these retire not so much the retirement homes, but the, these retirement villages, and when it, what's ended up happening is they're, they're spreading all these STDs, these sexually transmitted diseases. Now there's a boom of sexually transmitted diseases among the elderly from, taking, from these people taking Viagra. Okay, so look at the fruit is what I'm trying to get you to do. Middle-aged and elderly women are taking menopause medication. Millions of the general public are taking Prozac, lithium, Haldrol, and other powerful antidepressants. Others are on medications for high blood pressure, diabetes, heart problems, arthritis, cancer, Alzheimer's, asthma, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, thyroid conditions, anxiety, weight problems, and who knows what else. Now again, you cannot drug your body into good health. It's just impossible to do. I'm, I mean, it just can't be any more blunt than that. And then it goes, this doesn't even include the untold number of illegal drugs that are being used. Where does it end? Why does it appear that the world is blinded to these issues? The first thing most people do when they get in a sniffle is to run to the doctor as if there's some kind of magic pill that will fix everything and make it go away. People need to learn to trust, um, well, in God, and that their God-given immune systems and natural products God has given us to get well instead of trusting doctors who prescribe medicine like it's candy. Now, one of the reasons so many people are coming down with so many things is because we are so depleted and we are so toxic. Our immune systems are like, and then you go and then you take more toxic drugs. You take an antibiotic, which means, the word antibiotic, anti means against, biotic means life. So, uh, antibiotics mean against life. Okay, that's why you take a probiotic, pro means for life. Okay, that puts the good live bacteria back in the intestinal tract. Antibiotics kill all that good bacteria, which is a large portion of our immune system in the intestinal tract. They even have commercials now in Activia where they're saying, you know, 70% of our, of our immune system exists in the intestinal tract. Well, they're actually accurate about that, but there's more than just taking um, these things that, like Activia for your immune system. There's things like trace minerals like zinc, true vitamin C from a food source. Uh, there's a lot of different things that comprise our immune system. And we're only as strong as the weakest link. So uh, these are just some other things to think about. Instead of putting your trust in the pharmaceutical medicine, you should be putting your trust in the one who can really save you. Um, John 3, 14 and 15 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent, serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whatso, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's an interesting parallel between what we had just talked about before. Malachi 4, 2 says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Wow! So I, that's why I'm always emphasizing the fear of God and humility and meekness before God. Because humility and meekness before God is associated with fear of God. Okay? And you can do um, keyword studies for that in the Bible and see that they're all integrally related. But it says, but unto you that fear my name 
shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And also, I just read a verse the other day about those that fear his name, he will show the secret of God. In other words, he's going to show you the scriptures, he's going to lay them out, but do you fear him? Well, no, he's the big guy in the sky. He's my heavenly bellhop. I don't fear him. He's, he's just, you know, he's our friend, he's our butt. No, understand something, that yes, God is all merciful and he's all loving, but there's also another side to God, and it's a side of judgment, and it's a side of judgment against sin, and these types of things. And we are to fear him, and f the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, it's the beginning of understanding, it's the beginning of knowledge. The Bible says, the angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him. But see, it's not something that's hardly ever preached on. So we don't really think about it too much. And I've done several teachings on this. Um, I believe the one was the overcoming and the fear of the Lord. So you can look that up if you like. An excellent story was posted on the internet recently titled, Too Little is Known About the Long-Term Effects of Most Popular Drugs. It was written by Thomas Moore and posted on the Washington Online Health and Medicine website. Here are just a few of the highlights from the story. An NIH study with 42,000 participants found that the blood pressure drug Cardura, one of a family of alpha blockers taken by one million people, was so ineffective at preventing strokes and heart failure that patients taking Cardura needed to be switched to more effective medication. Although new drugs are usually studied in thousands of patients for short periods, the international standard provides the drugs intended for lifetime use should be tested only in about 100 people for periods of one year or more. Although Food and Drug Administration requirements for just some drugs are stricter, U.S. law does not provide for the long-term testing of drugs before or after approval for marketing. Even when lives are at stake, drug companies and other health authorities repeatedly have failed to warn doctors and patients about the newly discovered problems or ensure that they halt treatment or to switch to a better drug. The failure to provide for long-term testing of drugs and to make Wise use of the results constitutes perhaps the single most dangerous flaw in a system intended to protect patients from unnecessary harm from prescription drugs. The system so rife with examples of drugs that fail to deliver on their promises is a system in crisis. Add the fact that so many who take these drugs are exposed to unnecessary risks in major events such as heart attack, stroke. The need for reform is clear. A story appeared in the June 1998 edition of the Orlando Sentinel that exposes some of the fraud within the pharmaceutical industry in approving new drugs. The story was written by Stephen Freed in a special to the Washington Post and was entitled, the, and was titled Inside the FDA. From that we read, agency officers know, for instance, that the organization doesn't actually test new drugs. The pharmaceutical companies are the ones that do. So it's like the fox guarding the hen house, okay? It's a farce. And they subject their results pretty much on the honor code, <laughs> as though they have any honor. They know the drugs are tested on no more than three to 4,000 people before approval, and that many drug safety problems will not show up in that small of a sample. Medical officers also know that the system for catching these problems after approval is woefully inadequate. This story verifies that we are dealing with a self-regulated industry with no real checks and balances in place. Another story appeared in the Orlando Sentinel, July 4th, 2001, reported new risks associated with the cancer drug tamoxifen. tamoxifen. <clears throat> new research suggests that women taking breast cancer drug tamoxifen have increased chance of getting a more aggressive form of the disease or cancer if a new tumor appears in their previously healthy breast. The new research found tamoxifen Users who developed new tumors were five times more likely than non-users to get the more deadly kind of tumor referred to as estrogen negative. You can see how insane this is. Here's another example. One of my favorites. Wayfarin, or also known as Coumadin. Now, this is from Wikipedia. This is what, and I, this is well known. But I wanted to kind of do it from, let's say, a more of a neutral source. I'm not saying I recommend Wikipedia for everything. But I'm saying... The, act, the information they're giving here is accurate. Wayfarin, also known as Coumadin, Jantavin, Maravan, or Warin, is an anticoagulant medication that is administered orally or very rarely by injection. Wayfarin is a... Now, this is a drug a ton of people are on, okay, because these are the ones that have heart disease and they've got plaquing. Oh, what we need to do is thin the blood. No, let's not clean the arteries out. Let's just thin the blood and make it watery thin so that the heart can pump it through the plaque up arteries easier. That sounds like the solution to me, but that's exactly what they're doing. 
Okay? Wayfarin, listen to this, and this is true, Wayfarin is a synthetic derivative of coumarin, a chemical found naturally in many plants. But Wayfarin was originally developed as a rat poison. But it is no longer used for that purpose, as modern poisons are much more toxic and potent. Well, you know, that's a great excuse. Much, these, these new toxic poisons are much more potent than, than the rat poison that Wayfarin is. It's still rat poison. It's still rat poison. But, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of other modern poisons that are more potent and toxic, so it fell out of use of favor. You know, I'm sure the rats probably didn't like that because it wasn't, you know, it was less potent than the new poisons. However, wayfarin and contemporary ro rodenticides, meaning pesticides that kill rodents, belong to the same class of drugs, coumarins, and both decrease blood coagulation by interfering with vitamin K metabolism. Vitamin K is what we have to have in order to have proper blood thickening and coagulation. Okay, if you have somebody, like if somebody cut their finger, like a hemophiliac or something, they don't stop bleeding, they don't have enough vitamin K. Okay, so the best form of vitamin K that there is, is true oil-based chlorophyll. But I don't mean the water-based, which is what you get in the health food store. The only, there's only one company that I know of that makes oil-based chlorophyll in that standard process. Um, you can look them up on the internet. So anyway, yeah, it's rat poison. Here's, a, here's an article that appeared in Newsday.com. Wayfarin, or Coumadin, is tied to risk of brain bleeds. Elderly people who take the popular blunt-thinning medicine Wayfarin, or Coumadin, it, to prevent heart attacks or strokes, may be at greater risk for serious brain hemorrhage. According to new study, scientists at University of Cincinnati of College of Medicine found that the use of anticoagulant medicine increased in the 1990s, and a surge of prescriptions caused a rise in the number of drug-induced intracerebral hemorrhages, especially in people over 80. Here's another one. Bleeding strokes from blood, blood thinners grow. Um, bleeding strokes increased five-fold among people who took the widely prescribed blood thinner in the 1990s. Um, the study in Monday's issue of Neurology also found that among 80 patients who took Wayfarin or Coumadin, the incidence of bleeding strokes increased by more than 10 times from 1988 to 1999. Now again, this isn't stuff that's, that's being popularized by the, the MDs or the pharmaceutical companies. This is how they make their living. Okay, this is how they make their living. So they're, they're going to downplay all of this thing. Now can you imagine if the alternative healthcare industry, and I mean ones that are putting out good, like, let's say, whole food vitamins and minerals. If any of this happened in that, they would have shut down the industry so quick. And, and they, they'll do that now. They'll make stuff up in order to try to, to demonize vitamins and minerals and these types of things. But it's okay for them. Do you realize that if you do the math, the, the, the medical profession is the number one killer of people in America, not heart disease and cancer. No, if you do the math, if you add up the pharmaceutical drugs that are killing people, the properly prescribed and non-properly prescribed, then if you add up what they call nosocomial infections, which are infections people get while they're in the hospital, then you add up the, the botched surgeries or the side effects of the drugs killing people, if you add all that up, that way more exceeds the, the, the total risk, the total people dying from heart disease and cancer. So they are, the pharmaceutical medical industry is the number one killer of people in the United States by far, and yet nothing's said. You know, modern medicine is the only way in, in, in you know, these types of things. So, going back to the article, then we come to the, one of the most abused ph pharmaceutical drugs on the market today with terrible side effects. It's relatively new pain medicine called OxyContin. Well, it's not relatively new anymore. This drug contains a powerful alkaloid derived from opium. It has replaced cocaine, heroin, and ecstasy as the number one killer in the state of Florida, which is where I live. Okay, now, I, if anybody has experience with this drug, not personal experience, because I never take this stuff, I wouldn't touch this stuff with a 10-foot pole, but if anybody has experience with people that have been on this drug, I have. Because I worked in a clinic with an MD, and I was a chiropractor, and he was the MD. And if people came in from auto accidents, many times he would prescribe them meds for their pain. Now, I later found out that he was prescribing OxyContin much of the time. And this is something that these people were requesting. Well, when we did research into OxyContin, we found out that OxyContin was originally developed as a cancer drug for terminal cancer patients. 
Why was it prescribed? Because they knew it was so addictive that only people that had terminal cancer should be on it because it really doesn't matter. They felt, they felt, that if, if a terminal cancer patient get, gets hooked on OxyContin, what, what's the big deal? Because they're going to die anyway. That was their rationale, at least. I'm not saying it was mine. OxyContin is so incredibly addictive that literally one dose, just like crystal meth, you can be hooked on it. I have seen that drug turn more people into, I, I don't even know what the proper word is, it's like it turns them into, into habitual pathological liars overnight. I'm sorry, but that has been my experience with that drug. Habitual pathological liars that will do anything to get their next fix. I've literally seen this happen to people overnight. Why? Because it's so powerful and it opens such big demonic doorways that the change that you will see in somebody when they go on that drug is so radical. It's, it's like anything else. I mean, you know, the more powerful the drug, the more demons and the more demonic doorways you're opening up. Highly addictive. Wasn't meant for people other than terminal cancer patients. And um, I have dealt with more people. And, you, you know, these people, they would come in, and a lot of times they would actually get in accidents, I believe on purpose, come in, and they were called candy seekers. Now, I didn't deal with this from All I cared about was getting the patients better. But they, the patients didn't even care about getting better. The ones that were hooked on this stuff, all they cared about was getting their drug and maybe getting a settlement from the, from the auto accident thing. It's one of the reasons I got out of this. Because I didn't want anything more to do with it. It didn't matter if I wanted to be a good doctor, wanted to try to help people. There was so much other wickedness going on, not only with the patients, but with the doctor prescribing with his magic prescription pad. I got to a point where I didn't want anything more to do with it. And um, thank God the Lord pulled me out of it. So these people would come in and, you know, they were drug addicts. Absolute, total drug addicts. They didn't have any integrity, their word meant nothing, they were habitual liars, they would lie to the nth degree right to your face in order to justify getting whatever they wanted, and many times it was more drugs, and they were called candy seekers, and they did this, they went from one accident to the next accident to the next accident, and they were playing the system, that's all they were really doing, so it says this is the number one uh, killer in the state of Florida as far as it's replacing heroin, uh, cocaine, and ecstasy. People suffering from tremendous pain have become junkies on this drug. Oxycontin sales. Now, this is just one drug we're talking about. One drug out of the many, 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 many evil drugs that are out there. Oxycontin is becoming the fastest drug of choice in America. Oxycontin sales in the year 2000 were over a billion dollars. A billion. That's incomprehensible. That was the year 2000. Who knows what it is today, eight years later? It's no different. Oxycontin, it's unbelievable to, to me, even as corrupt as the FDA and the pharmaceutical profession is, it is incomprehensible to me that they have left this drug on the market. I, I just, it is just testament to the fact of how evil this profession truly is, and truly their desired goal to dumb down and to kill off as many of us as they can prior to the Antichrist coming to power. And that's not my words, that's their words. Ted Turner stated flat out that, that he believes world, the world population needs to go to 250 uh, million to 350 million, which would be about a 95% population reduction. Maurice Strong, pr presider of... Um, uh, that Agenda 21 in the UN, you know, it, all of these guys at the top are saying the same thing, that we've got to reduce world population. It's just one of the many ways. OxyContin is fast becoming the new drug of choice in America. The tablets are manufactured in a time-release delivery system. They are designed to deliver pain-killing effectiveness between 12 and 24-hour periods. On the, on the streets, the street users either chew the tablets or they crush them and they snort the powder or they boil them down in the tablets and inject it intravenously because it bypasses the time release mechanism and delivers a powerful, euphoric, heroin-like punch. Entire towns and neighborhoods are dealing with these problems associated with the OxyContin. The Roanoke Times ran a story on August 16, 2000 that reported OxyContin to be the worst problem seen in the community. Tazewell 
County's prosecutor has charged more than 150 people in last year with felonies associated with the addictive painkiller. And, and again, they just leave it on the market, you know, oh, we, we need it, we, we, we need this terrible drug. Tazewell County Commonwealth Attorney Dennis Lee called uh, Attorney Dennis Lee called the abuse of OxyContin an epidemic. Andy Anderson, a narcotics detective from Polanski Police Department, estimated that 90% of the people in Polanski who admitted to such crimes as breaking and entering, shoplifting, forgery, stealing checks, said they committed the crimes to get money to finance their OxyContin addiction. 90%. And look at the fruit. Look at this is just one more little bud or apple, rotten piece of rotten fruit from the medical profession. Shoplifting, forgery, stealing checks. Remember what I said earlier? Oxycontin, from what I have seen, tends to turn people overnight into absolute, total, habitual um, liars, pathological liars. And I'm talking about lying with no conscience whatsoever. It's as though it sears their conscience with a hot iron when it talks about in First Timothy for one. Now I'm not saying that everybody that's on Oxycontin has no hope of ever getting saved. But the longer you stay on these mind altering drugs and the more they fry your mind, the harder it is for you to get saved. I mean, let's face it, the more demonic control something has over you, and I know Jesus Christ can, can, is the only one that can help them in this situation, but it's a proven fact, the longer somebody stays in this junk, the harder it is for them to ever have a hope of getting saved. In conclusion, in this article, there's much more that can be said about the harmful effects of the pharmaceutical medicine. To cover all these facts in great detail would take a large book. The purpose of this study has been to summarize the issues and enlighten you to the roots of the pharmaceutical industry and to show you there is a sinister force behind the increase of pharmaceutical drugs. The story offers no medical advice other than warning readers to beware of the sorcerer's medicine. I hope you've been educated by the story and that it prompts you to take a closer look at the pharmaceutical industry before buying into their propaganda. Look for more pharmaceutical exposés in the future. And uh, next week we're going to actually cover, they really didn't cover the roots of the modern pharmaceutical industry. Next week we're really going to cover the roots. Well, as I said, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And that's what we're going to be looking at. And it's even more horrific than what I went over today. Okay. So I'll go ahead and close this out in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time and this day that you've given us. I pray, Lord God, that wherever your word, wherever your truth is being brought forth worldwide, that you would bless it, Lord. And that, Lord God, that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, that you would forgive us for any and all sins we've committed in any way, shape, or form, Lord God, as we forgive those who have sinned against us, that we would have mercy upon those, Lord God, that have sinned against us. And Lord God, that you would have mercy upon us and the body of Christ, that you would bless the body of Christ, that you would bless the orphans and the widows and the weak and the meek, Lord God, those that don't have food, those that don't have water. I pray, Lord God, that you bless them, that you supply all their needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that thy name be glorified through the body of Christ and that many people would be saved as a result of what you would do through the body of Christ this day. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.